this is update for no November 4th, 2023, day 619 of the war and of the date update. I also catch up for uh, November 3 and November 2. So I'm going to start with a um, strategic update, but it's going to be purely focused on Ukraine. And then I'm going to do a walk through the front line as I always do. Uh, so the I think uh, the most... Uh, uh, important and shocking probably news for the West, uh, but hopefully not uh, to the viewers of uh, of this channel, was the um, uh, article by um, uh, the head of Ukrainian uh, military um, in The Economist, where he basically um, put forward, I think, two important um, ideas is, um, first, uh, there is a stalemate on the front line and I would say that uh, this is actually not a correct assessment and it's not really sober enough uh, the reality is, is Ukraine is losing at this moment uh, and on the pass uh, for the catastrophe uh, simply because as I mentioned before it's war of attrition and um, if Ukraine is not winning in this war, it's meaning it's losing. And at this point, it's clearly not winning. Uh, Ukraine does not have uh, resources in terms of people um, <clears throat> to continue the war it's being done. And as I said many times before, it's being done using sort of as a Soviet army where the main resource are people and it's um, you know, people are the tool and expendable resource and um, if, since Ukraine is at least four times four times smaller than Russia um, there is no way to to win uh, in the war in that way so it has to be war of quality uh, <clears throat> and that's not how it's being uh, done right now the second part actually related to this situation is actually admission uh, by the head of Ukrainian military that um, he's effectively um, incompetent uh, and um, effectively he relies on some miracle and some technological hope change breakthrough that will change the course of the war but there is no even a realization uh, that there is an organizational problem uh, starting from himself and the, the very top of Ukrainian military all of the Sort of the, the, the top-ranking officers, they are effectively unfit and incompetent and typical sort of Soviet uh, generals uh, that simply will not be able to sort of change mentally and, and just uh, say too late for them to change. And <clears throat> so again, uh, this really um, mm, a very negative verdict for Ukraine going forward is... Uh, a, um, you know, Ukraine is losing. B, you have people who are incompetent and not capable of changing, or not that don't have any strategy of how to um, to win in this war, uh, and that's a that's the biggest problem. And uh, Ukrainian president, his political sort of clique is is the same kind. Is is in many ways it's worse because. Uh, there is a lot of allegations that uh, they are actually working for um, for Russia, essentially like as uh, agents of influence or, or really, really like a sabotage groups. So um, uh, basically, that's that's a, that's sort of the problem, existential problem Ukraine is facing. I've been mentioning about this before, and um, I think it's coming sort of this sort of moment of recognition of the situation is coming closer um, with every day that I don't I'm not saying that Ukraine is going to crumble in in a, in a week or two or months or two uh, but uh, 2024 is definitely going to be the year uh, where it's all going to get sort of decided one way or another uh, and <clears throat> and I would say that uh, there is um, other Say uh, delusional, probably thinking in the West that uh, Russia just wants to keep what it captured so far, which is as everybody knows, this whole area, uh, and then that's all it is. Uh, Russia is definitely, definitely wants to um, 
capture all of Ukraine. So the Russian troops will be on the border with uh, Poland, on the border with Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Romania, and, and also Russia. Russia will uh, capture Moldova, which is this. Uh, because uh, there were a couple of interviews over past uh, probably two weeks by Russian president where he clearly stated that uh, Ukraine did not exist. So basically he does not accept uh, existence of Ukraine. And um, the more important, I think, he clearly uh, outlined that this is a cultural war. Uh, this is uh, much more than um, just simply military war, which is the old wars are always <clears throat> truly are. It's about culture and worldview and, and sort of what you call it philosophy and so on. Uh, by culture, I mean not just uh, sort of um, I'd say primitive traditions, but it's more of uh, philosophical worldview, the, the the values and and the vision of the future, essentially. That's what I mean by culture. Uh, and so uh, again, um, from that perspective, Russia will continue until it will uh, capture all of Ukraine, as I said. Uh, and it does look that uh, uh, it's actually not going to stop with just Ukraine. And um, there is a clear desire uh, to uh, capture part of uh, Poland and probably eastern Poland, east of uh, uh, the Stula River. Um, and the, the whole idea is to essentially rebuild uh, Russian Empire, which is uh, what is... Uh, right now being done inside of Russia because Russian uh, president he's actively building sort of this um, multicultural multi-ethnic uh, empire that's sort of the vision he has and that's what uh, to the point that uh, basically um, sort of it's Russia uh, only nominally only in the name uh, and really it's about uh, Sort of um, this uh, multi-ethnic empire, essentially. That's uh, that's what he's building, and um, in his view, the part of Poland sort of belonged uh, to Russian Empire, and so it should be sort of taken back. And that else that will also um, um, will uh, let's say create land access to Kaliningrad region. Uh, and also Baltic states probably going to be sort of up for grabs as well. Um, so again, this is not, uh, you know, some kind of, as I said, it's a very delusional view. Uh, that This is just uh, sort of fighting for this, you know, uh, territories that so far were captured or defending that, those territories from Russian perspective. Um, the... Russia's um, views are much more ambitious, and and they and this is all driven also by the world situation, where um, say West is on defensive. West, um, in many ways, lost its way in terms of its uh, values, uh, or, or in some ways, it's uh, lost sort of its old traditional values, and uh, the new values are basically are not working, and uh, not working for the rest of the world either. And so they're not being accepted. And and Russian president is clearly understanding that and feeling that. Uh, and that's the part of the consensus he has with the Chinese president. Um, not, um, Iran is a different story, but uh, with China, that's the whole vision that they believe that they will change, recraft, reorganize the world to their sort of values, their vision and so on. And the West is going to be sort of in a way subjugated. Uh, in this new world. So um, uh, the, so this is sort of part w w that sort of uh, re that sort of relates to Ukraine and Russia and then uh, the situation um, uh, in the US, uh, the, 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 mm, the, the help for Ukraine is being blocked at this point. And the blockage is very simple is because um, the Mm, the Republican uh, uh, members of the parliament uh, uh, in the U.S., they demand clear vision how this war is going to be won from 
uh, from the U.S. president. And uh, because there's no clear vision, there's no way this war can be won the way it's being done. And with the Ukraine, you know, with the current Ukrainian president, with the current Ukrainian military top, um, that's why there is no sort of, um, you know, discussion or response from um, uh, from the U.S. president towards this uh, <clears throat> members of the parliament who demand clear understanding, like you know, how things going to be won, which is pretty reasonable, I would say. And so this is whole, you know, another problem uh, because, you know, if there is no clear message, no clear understanding how this is going to be won, then there is no desire to give, uh, you know, to support Ukraine financially, military-wise, and, and so on. Uh, the, the situation may simply force the hands uh, of the uh, U.S. parliament, but it's just all unclear how it's going to play out. Uh, the bigger even problem that even uh, like this help that may come later, military-wise, if there is decision to do that, uh, it might be uh, too little too late, as they say. Uh, <clears throat> because there is another strategic problem that Ukraine is facing and um, it's becoming more obvious, I mentioned this before, is the quality of the uh, soldiers is dropping down significantly. And by that, I mean mostly motivation. Uh, that's where the problem is. Ukraine, Ukrainian military and political uh, leadership completely wasted uh, very valuable resources, uh, resource which is people, the most valuable resource which is people, uh, over a year and a half where the sort of most motivated people basically were wasted in, um, uh, in the defensive and, uh, and offensive actions that essentially didn't bring much of a success uh, for Ukraine. Uh, but costed, um, you know, human lives are totally in, in, invaluable cost. There's no price for it. But even more so, there is th this, these people were super motivated <clears throat> and sort of that that's the biggest loss at this point. Um, it got to the point that um, the problem with motivation is such that, for example, and I will uh, get to, um, once I get to Avdiv, I'll discuss that, that uh, Ukrainian command had to bring 47 uh, brigade, or at least parts of it, that I don't know exact details, from, from the Parisian front line to Avdivka uh, to stabilize from there, because the, the other brigades there, they were not able to sort of, uh, there's not enough lack of motivation, let's put it this way. Um, and so you, you kind of throw your valuable resource uh, to so that there is no uh, collapse and Avdiivka is not going to get lost. Uh, that's all in terms of um, strategic update, general update. Uh, now let's uh, switch to walk through the front line in a clockwise fashion, as I always do. So first, uh, situation along the state border is quiet. Nothing is happening there. I would say very quiet on relative scale. Now let's move to the North Luhansk front line. Uh, here things remain more or less the same. Some Russian tactical pressure uh, that's mostly in this area uh, directed towards Kupiansk. But so far Ukrainian forces are holding on uh, and there is uh, no... Uh, there imminent or immediate sort of threat of anything. Again, it's all tactical pressure. Uh, now let's move to the uh, North uh, Donbass front line. Uh, the northern sector is quiet as always is. Uh, in the southern part, there is some um, Russian uh, tactical local counterattacks to basically recapture lost ground. Uh, it's, I would say, in some way, sort of like a half-hearted attack just to kind of also paint the picture by Russian military command that they're doing something. And that's I, I would, how I would assess what they're doing there. Uh, now let's move to the uh, central Donbass front line. Uh, so this is where, obviously, the sort of problem area right now for Ukrainian side. Uh, which is Avdivka, and just jumping ahead, Marinka is sort of under control, there is no problem there. Uh, and as you can see, Ukrainian command had to throw in simply 
um, uh, a lot of brigades just to kind of plug the holes and uh, prevent uh, the loss of Avdiivka, which it shouldn't be happening. It's a fairly mm, good position to defend because you have this huge plant, um, uh, this uh, coking uh, coal plant or whatever it's called. Uh, basically, that allows you to, for excellent defensive position. Uh, yet, um, you know, there there is a problem there, and uh, I'll show you uh, what's going on. So this was on October 14, a um, few days after initial Russian uh, attack, and uh, this is where it stands um, right now. Plus minus, not perfect, but uh, basically Russian side continuing pressure on the north. Uh, they are for the basically the railroad line is becoming this defensive line and actually Russian troops managed to establish bridgehead on the other side of the um, of the railroad line which um, is really bad sort of development bad situation because there is no um, uh, good defensive lines uh, you know in this area so they're sort of like this um, uh, coking coke plant is by itself pretty good defensive position, but if uh, Russian troops manage to make this decisive, decisive breakout here north of it, uh, that really creates really a lot of opportunities and, and basically can collapse this whole area. And uh, you know, Ukrainian troops will have to hastily withdraw, and, and so essentially, it, it's going to be a problem. Uh, again, this should not be happening. The, 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 the position in general here is, I would say, one of the better ones. Uh, and the, the whole, the, this whole situation with all of these problems is uh, mostly driven by the uh, motivation of the troops, I would say. Um, and obviously organizational command as well, because Ukraine has advantage in artillery and should be able to basically suppress any offensive uh, attempts by the Russian side. Uh, and it wasn't done sort of in a timely fashion initially. Uh, uh, the, the sort of tactical change here after significant losses in equipment by Russian side, they simply switch to the infantry attacks at this point. It's all infantry. Uh, with support of artillery and that's pretty much all it is uh, here and um, and so this actually works better for the Russian side uh, they actually managed to to make this sort of um, you know territorially they look fairly small gains uh, but actually strategically from locally strategically uh, they are actually important gains and it's all being done with the help of uh, infantry with only infantry um, sort of basically only infantry without uh, uh, the heavy um, heavy equipment support and by, by that I mean no tanks and uh, no essentially IFVs it's artillery and um, and people uh, which goes back again to the whole idea is that um, you know, people is the most potent weapon the most dangerous weapon so um, so the situation for now seems to be somewhat stabilized by Ukrainian command that simply threw more resources into this to plug the hole. Um, you know, the long-term viability of defending of Divka uh, remains actually um, under the question. And as I said, it's not because the defensive positions are in some ways, so I would almost say, excellent. Uh, it's more driven by the organizational problems and motivational problems. So that's that's all that's that's there because uh, Ukraine definitely has better artillery than uh, the Russian side. Uh, now let's move to uh, Zaporizhia front line, which is turning sort of kind of like in a quiet zone at this point, or at least some uh, Russian tactical attacks just to um, recapture lost ground without pretty much any success so this effectively turning into what it used to be for those who remember a while ago before actually uh, June uh, of this year it was fairly quiet section of the front line for almost uh, actually a year or a year and one month was very very quiet 
Um, now let's move to the um, section of the front, front line along the Dnipro River. Uh, things here remain more or less the same. Ukrainian uh, troops are holding on to the, those small bridgehead and a couple of very promising ones. Uh, Russian um, side is trying to um, destroy those bridgeheads. So far not, not successful, suffering pretty heavy losses uh, in terms of people actually, which is, uh, you know, helps Ukraine. This is how you, you know, you Ukraine need to to, to, to wage this war, uh, where Russia side is losing disproportionately. Uh, there isn't um, wide working bear, simply artillery support is much better organized than uh, on the other section of the front line, where essentially uh, Russian troops cannot even, Russian infantry, uh, uh, effectively cannot approach uh, Ukrainian infantry in terms of uh, you know, actual have, uh, you know, head-to-head -head fight uh, due to the support uh, by Ukrainian artillery from the other side of the uh, Dnipro River. Uh, the, the problem in ge generally uh, for Ukrainian forces is actually um, Russian gliding bombs. And I just want to explain what they are. They actually very primitive uh, old Soviet bombs that are actually were not gliding. Uh, and uh, basically, Russian um, military, Russian industry quickly developed a kit to essentially attach um, the the wings and effectively turn them into gliding guided uh, bombs, uh, which um, turn them into fairly potent weapon uh, because typically those bombs are at least like 500 kilograms of explosives. So it's essentially equivalent of the all of those uh, Russian missiles or equivalent of uh, Tochka U or um, I think it's also similar to uh, Attack MS, except, except this is super dirty cheap and Russia has um, tons um, of this um, bombs from Soviet time. So uh, it's a super efficient weapon from that perspective. Uh, they not always sort of hit what they sort of um, sort of aimed at, but um, because Russia has a lot of them, so uh, th this is creating significant problem um, for Ukrainian armies just from the perspective um, uh, when you have you when you have sort of positional defense. Right, where you're not moving, you're not on the move, then it's a problem, and and uh, and that's another problem. But in, in a way, with this bridgehead, that uh, it's effectively forces Ukrainian command to break out from those bridgeheads, or over long run, it's going to be expensive to hold on to them, uh, as Russia will intensify the use of these gliding bombs because they sense that they are sort of more efficient and they um, quickly ramping up use of those to sort of address as a, in attempt to wipe out those bridgeheads. So far, they're not sort of successful, but sort of this is the pass uh, where it's all going. And so uh, it's going to be a problem for Ukrainian side in, um, in the near future, let's put this way. Uh, that's all for today. Thanks for watching and until next time. Bye-bye.